from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hello, hello, hello. You have reached the Badass Counseling Show. My name is Sven Erlinson. I am the host of the show, and I am joined in studio, as always, by two people very close to me. And I'm going to introduce them in just a second. Uh, but whether you are tuning in from South Africa or New South Wales, whether you are tuning in from Belgium or Sweden or Canada or Houston or La Jolla or New Hampshire, it is wonderful to have you here. And we know we have listeners all around the world who listen weekly to our show, twice a week to our show, our counseling episodes on Thursdays and our lightning round, fast talking, answering questions on Sundays. Today is the most unusual day that we have ever had in the history of the Badass Counseling Show, which is now coming up on two years, uh, millions of downloads and numerous, numerous guests, hundreds of episodes. We have never ever interviewed a guest on this show. I've counseled many people on the show, and we have answered many thousands of questions on the lightning round days. And we've had many people reach out to us and saying, hey, I'd like to be on your show, or I'm booking this or that speaker, or this or that author, or this or that famous person uh, wanting to be on the show. And uh, invariably, Kate, my assistant, has to tell them, um, that's not the kind of show we have. We counsel people on the show. It's a counseling show, hence the name. However, um, I have someone that uh, I've grown to know um, who is basically, he. we've done some work together, and uh, he is a true blue American hero in so many ways, in, in the most, most elite of ways. And so I am breaking format of the show. And so I want you to welcome today uh, a gentleman by the name of Chief Master Sergeant, Jeremy Hardy, call sign Ho. And he is joining us today because he has a story that's going to blow your fucking mind. Um, it blows my mind every time uh, he and I talk, which is pretty much weekly. And I'm just in awe of this man. He is everything I wish I could have been in this lifetime. And so I had to settle for my little life. And uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. You know, it's an honor to have you on. I'm going to give a little bit of what I know about your background so that folks know, and then I want you to fill it in. Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy of the United States Air Force retired, was during his tenure uh, at the apex of his tenure with the United States Air Force, he was the top ranking special forces operator in the entire United States Air Force. That is a large branch of the UN, United States military, and he was the top operator. He's done a, deployments around the world, many of which he cannot talk about, many of which he can talk about. He has sustained injuries, and he served for uh, nearly three full decades honorably, discharged honorably. We're going to have a few of his stories today, but we are just as interested, not just in his military history, but what he is doing since he got out. Chief Hardy is pursuing his doctorate degree in psychology because he has a passion, and I'm starting to actually tear up a little bit, and I mean that. He has a passion for helping people. I guess serving his country and the world for 25 years wasn't enough. He gets out and he says, you know what? We need to get in there with those vets. I want to be able to help those vets and the first responders and the police and the fire and the ambulance and so forth. And he has dedicated his new life since getting out to serving others. And uh, he's uh, done some interesting things. But uh, Jeremy, uh, Chief, please uh, fill in the resume. What am I missing? And, and actually, you know what? I want you to answer two questions to start. What else is in that resume? And do not, this is not the time to be modest. You've earned that shit and I want to hear it, all right? Second question is, tell us, I think most of our listeners had no fucking clue that the United States Air Force had a special operations wing. I think most people think SEALs and Delta Force and Rangers and shit. So A, fill in your resume and B, what the hell are uh, the Air Force special operators? I think uh, 74 countries the last time uh, that I counted. Uh, I've been in continuous combat operations since I joined in 1990. So my very first uh, combat deployment was the first Gulf War. 
And then I've been in, uh, you know, I spent uh, several years in South America doing counter narcotics work. Um, before 9 11, obviously, after 9 11, it's been Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Djibouti, Africa, um, a couple, a couple other places that um, we don't talk about just yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. So, and, and to your second question, you know, what's, what's a PJ? Pararescue, pararescue jumpers, um, they call us PJs. Uh, we are special operations combat search and rescue. So I like to joke around and say, when the SEALs need 911, we're the guys that come and get them out. Mm. Uh, but but it's that. We, we support special operations forces. Um, every PJ is a nationally registered paramedic. Um, but we're not, but that's not a, we're not a medic. We're a rescue specialist. So we do swift water rescue. We do confined space collapse structure. We do high angle. Those teams you're talking about, you know, the SEALs and, and Delta and all that, those guys, they bring us along as enablers uh, to take care of things when it goes really, really bad. And almost invariably behind enemy lines, correct? Always. Always. A caveat. We do do a lot of humanitarian rescue as well. It makes sense then. I remember in my brief time at the Air Force Academy, my few years there, that uh, we, you know, had profound respect for the PJs, the parajumpers, you guys, uh, because we were being trained to be pilots. And if a pilot goes down behind enemy lines, it's you fuckers that are coming in to save our ass. And do I? And that's that was the original primary construction of the PJs. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Pre nine eleven, it was almost uh, almost just that. Okay. Uh, we expanded our capabilities and our mission set after 9-11, but yes. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, since, since the very first PJ mission in 1943 until 9-11, we were almost succinctly just four pilots shot down behind enemy lines. And you've told me two statistics, or maybe I've done it in my own research, that the pararescue of the United States Air Force, the PJs, are the it's the longest continuous special force or something like that. What's what's the phrase? Well, we, we are the only special operations force in the United States Air Force that's been in continuous combat operations since uh, 1990, August 2nd, 1990. Wow. And, um, and you've also told me that uh, pararescue, and most people don't know this. I'm not saying this to say, oh, you know, SEALs are less than or and nothing like that. I don't mean, I'm no disrespect to the other services. I'm just giving some light to the guys in under you and that you worked with that a lot of folks don't know about. And the other thing is, I think uh, I've read before that the longest pipeline to get into of all the special forces is actually the Air Force pararescue. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, that is accurate. Wow. So, so there's, it, it, you know, depending on scheduling, it could be over two and a half years. Wow. Okay. All right. So I want to get into, just to give folks an idea, um, again, of, uh, you served for how many years? Since 1990, is that accurate? Yeah. So I served uh, 25 years, wow. roughly. Okay. 24 years, seven months, and 17 days. <laughs> 25 years. <laughs> but who's counting? Uh, and right. so... And you have, you've saved many people. You've had many kills, which is part of your job. It's not just the saving, it's the killing as well. You are a trained killer and a trained saver by all of your training. Is that accurate or inaccurate? It is. I, I, used, to, I used to brag about the fact that my son told, uh, you know, used to tell people, my dad kills bad guys and saves good guys. That's all right. That was my job. Not a bad thing for a son to be proud of. That's all right. 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 And you had one in particular, if you would, uh, there's one in particular that I have watched videos of, uh, not the actual save, but accounts and and uh, the recounting of it and so forth. You saved one person, you and your team uh, saved one person in particular that sort of made you famous, whether you wanted to be or not, uh, because he yeah. went on to become or infamous. Yeah, or infamous. He went on to become very famous himself. Tell us about uh, the general. Very timely interview because uh, the anniversary was just a few days ago, All right, May 2nd of 1999. Uh, an F-16 pilot got shot down over Belgrade, Serbia, uh, when we were in, involved with the whole Kosovo um, uh, encounter. And uh, yeah, I, um, I was uh, the ground team leader. 
for a three man team that went in and and uh, got what's out. what's and, what's in a three man team? What's in a three man team? You got the helo bringing you in, so you got the pilot, probably a co pilot, and then you've got three others. What are the other three do? What are all three of you doing? What are your jobs? Yeah, so on the aircraft we have the pilot, the co pilot. We've got an aerial gunner and a flight engineer. All right, those are the crew. And then the guys in the back, the ones that actually get out and, and do the stuff on the ground, uh, is myself as a team leader. Uh, I've got a junior pararescue who's my primary medic. And then I have a combat controller, which is another specialty in the Air Force uh, that uh, concentrates on controlling aircraft uh, in a combat zone and also uh, doing what we call JTAC, Joint Terminal Air Control. So they, they're the ones that are calling bombs in when we need bombs in. And so a three-man team, it's two PJs, one controller. You know, it's a pretty, uh, a pretty standard construct, or at least it was, you know, through my retirement. And so on this mission, go ahead. We had uh, three helicopters. So two were big cargo kind of helicopters, right, CH, or MH-53. Uh, that each had a platoon of Green Berets. And they were the quick reaction, quick reaction force in case something happened. And then there was my team, and we were the ones that were supposed to go in and get out. Immediately after crossing the border from Bosnia into Serbia, uh, we took three surface air missiles, uh, big flaming telephone poles flying through the sky. Uh, the last of which actually came between the second helicopter and us. So it actually, I watched this thing fly maybe 50 meters from the helicopter. We, uh, where we originally thought the general was, uh, the coordinates were off uh, because of the national asset we were using. Um, it wasn't accurate, but they, you know, so it gave us uh, the, you know, a, a, a location where he might be. And as we were flying around looking for him, we were, you know, we got shot up pretty good. I think we took five rounds in the helicopter. Uh, before we got updated coordinates, we knew where he was. And uh, we went in and got, got him out. And uh, so what we didn't know at the time was we landed in a potential minefield. That's not confirmed. A minefield. But, okay. Right. Well, we, we don't, yeah, that's not confirmed. But we've been told after the fact. Fair. But we landed the helicopter. We saw his strobe light. So he was in a tree line. He didn't hunker down for, you know, a good 10 hours, actively running away from Baghdad. So this wasn't a, a Scott O'Grady kind of thing. Like he was actively running away from Baghdad. And um, we saw, you know, he, he, he turned on his strobe light. It was infrared. Um, we saw it. We landed. Um, me and the team ran out and did what we had to do. And uh, when I got to the general, uh, there's all kinds of classified questions we asked, and you know, just to make sure it's not a spy or a what we call a SAR trap, search and rescue trap. I kind of forgo, like, I, I kind of that all, that all let's just go. get the fuck out but, of here. Yeah, yeah. so, so the, the authentication was, hey, are you Dave? All right, let's go. <laughs> and, no, uh, wait, I'm and, Steve. And, okay, we'll come back <laughs> to you later. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, and it was relatively benign. I mean, well, but, you know, in, in combat terms. Um, but I uh, remember I grabbed him by the flight suit just to make sure that he was in one piece. And it felt like, the, like, felt like somebody was hitting the ground around me with sledgehammer. And I had night vision goggles on, and uh, there was all these strobe lights going off in the tree line. And I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense because nobody's supposed to be out here. And then my mind connected and realized the sledgehammer were bullets impacting, and the strobe lights were muzzle flashes. Oh, fuck me. We, we were getting lit up. Wow. And so at that point, uh, discretion was the better part of valor, and uh, I just kind of grabbed the guy and we threw him in a helicopter and we all jumped on top of him. So, you know, keep him safe from the, the, the rounds coming in and we took off. And, uh, I, I will tell you, you know, he went on obviously to become chief staff, number 20th, 
Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. 25th uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. Correct. Four-star yeah. general. Mm-hmm. Served on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Correct. Wow. So we're all clear. His name is General? Dave Goldstein. Dave, Dave Goldstein. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, it was great because on the second, uh, he and I went and had dinner. And uh, we called all the other guys on the mission and got our own, had our own little reunion, 25th uh, anniversary reunion. And I understand uh, every once in a while uh, you and uh, your team and he get together and uh, share some scotch, if I'm not mistaken. He, on the anniversary of his shootout, every May 2nd, he sends out a bottle of scotch <laughs> and um, good stuff. And, and he tries to time it. So if it's the 21st year, he gets 21 year scotch. You know, holy on, shit! On and on and on. But, holy shit! Good man. He spends a lot of money on scotch. Well, and I, uh, wow. as he likes to joke, uh, you know, his the, the 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 men that rescued him want him to live a long life. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. All right. <clears throat> so, folks, that gives you a little bit of an idea um, about who Chief is, and uh, so an absolute badass, lifesaver, honorable, uh, but. That's just part of the story. And, and, and Chief has a million other stories, and they're all just gr- as gripping as that one or even more so. And he left out stuff. You know, my, uh, my controllers, you know, you know, giving us cover fire, and I'm running. He probably ran 100 yards away the length of a football field. He's probably, you know, ca- carrying the chief or carrying the, the pilot and all the stuff he left out, you know, because he's modest and so forth. But I want to get at why we're having him on the show today. We're having him on the show today. We were actually, uh, Chief and I have been talking for well over a year. Uh, we've, we've known each other a bit longer than that, uh, but we, we've wanted to, I've wanted to get him on the show. And we've talked about him coming up here because I'm in the New York City area. We are, the team is. Uh, he's uh, down south. And uh, we thought about going down there. We've talked about bringing him up here. We're actually planning it for February. And then uh, uh, Chief got some really bad news. And, uh, and I want you to tell us what that is, Chief. Uh, and so we had to accelerate everything. And that's why we're on a Zoom call instead of in person. We had to accelerate everything. We were actually looking at summer. We had to accelerate it just within weeks. Um, tell us, Chief, what uh, the news is that you learned recently. I was recently diagnosed with uh, stage two osteosarcoma, which is a bone cancer. Bone cancer, which normally, you have told me, originates in the leg but in you, well, first, before we get to where it, it is in you primarily, tell us the most recent news of the other aspect of it and this uh, beautiful giant hole in your chest. Yeah, so one of the unfortunate uh, side effects of chemotherapy is something called pleural effusion. Um, water on the lungs, thing called. Um, we all have fluid between our lungs and our chest cavities. Uh, I accumulated too much, and it was collapsing my lungs, and it was pressing on my heart. Mm. And so um, I had to spend, a, you know, got to spend a couple of days in the VA hospital, and chest tube in my in my chest, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the doctors have said, give it to us straight. What have the doctors said is your percent, percentage chance of living or dying? Fifty to seventy percent over the next ten. Years. Just so we're clear, 50 to 70% chance of dying over, yeah. over the next 10 years. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And but, I, but those are quitters. Oh, for sure. No, you're, you're going to kick this thing in, your, in the ass just like you always have with everything. I have no doubt about that. And we ha- hope to be doing more of these interviews with you in the future. But now the most interesting part. Osteosarcoma normally... Uh, begins in the leg, if I heard uh, what you've told me correctly, but yours began in your face. Why Correct. your face? Please tell us. In 2009, um, I was attached to a field team, and I was the assistant breacher, and I was putting a breaching charge on a metal door, and a sniper round hit that metal door, and I caught the shrapnel in the face. And... Uh, there, one of two theories. So uh, one is there was an irradiated round. Uh, the other was in 2011 uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, uh, we were at a defunct Russian airport 
supporting a three-letter agency uh, doing some work. And uh, they turned on this radar sign and irradiated the entire helicopter. So one of those two things, if not both, uh, is, is probably the source of, of the oxygen circum. So you have inside of your face, you have an irradiated piece of shrapnel from a bullet that hit a door. And we know you have that in your face. It may be irradiated right. or the radiation may have come from when your entire helicopter and crew was blasted with um, radiation. One of those two is what, you, or both is what you're saying. Correct. What are the yeah. fucking odds? Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> just when you thought you had paid the full price, uh, you continue to continue to pay and and so forth. So when you and I talked in anticipation of this, as we've been talking about it over the months, I asked you what I couldn't couldn't ask about. You know what? Because I, I don't want to step on any toes and so forth. And you said open book. You know nothing's off limits and so forth. Correct. Um, and so I want to ask you straight up. You've faced war and death every day of your life, and but this one is. There's nobody shooting at you now. And what does it feel like to know that you have a 50 to 70% chance of dying? Even it could happen within the year or within 10 years or not at all. I'm sure, again, I'm sure you're going to kick it in the ass. What does it feel like? I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I was, uh, I was angry with God for a little bit. I was mad. I'm like, this? After all the combat missions, after all of the operations, uh, this is the way I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to... And I'm clearly not afraid of death, but I don't want to waste. I don't want to like, waste away, mm. right? I have a very good friend, very good PJ friend right now who is, who's dying of prostate cancer. And, and, and uh, the guy's just a physical specimen. Uh, and now he's a skeleton, you know, because he's wasting away. What is that? And, and what's that like for you to see that in somebody that you knew was a god, physically and you know an, an animal driven just focused so good at his work to right. see him in this state what does that feel like for you as his dear friend and to love him as a brother what does that feel like it, it, it's frightening it, you know it, it's again I'm, I'm not afraid to die it's the wasting away part like I, I love this man and and he was such a I mean he was my mountain phase instructor when I was going through pararescue school uh, he and I were in a movie together. Um, he's just been this like specimen of a human being. And so to watch that and then think about, well, that might be me in six months, a year, two years, whatever. Uh, it's, it's frightening. It, it's, it's not a comfortable feel. Let me ask you, know? you, if you hadn't had the, your own cancer diagnosis, if your health were fine, What's it like? So that adds an element of frightening. Uh, but what's it like just to see someone so vigorous that you love and that you've done so many missions with and was your mountain phase instructor when you were going through training? Just what's it? what does it do to you guys? I mean, you guys are the ultimate badasses. I'm a fucking pussy compared to you guys. You guys are the ultimate. What's it like to see someone so vigorous become so frail? What, what happens inside of you? In the 24th wing, we buried 23 operatives since 9 11. Wow. Right, 23 men that uh, we've lost in combat. Uh, but when a guy goes out, guns blaring, that's one thing. Uh, when you watch somebody after going through all of that to go out in that way, it seems less than honorable. Mm. It's hard. Uh, you know, uh, another, uh, another example. Uh, my one of my mentors, uh, uh, Chief Bob Holler, he was a Vietnam era terrorist. I mean, this guy was with the Miguez. He was like he was one of the last belligerents to fire a weapon in Vietnam. Wow. And uh, and his last mission was after 9-11, flying helicopters in Afghanistan. And he died in a helicopter uh, uh, skydiving accident, you know. A year, less than a year after all of that, <laughs> oh, and uh, so when you look back at that and you go, we all want to go out in the blaze, 
And, uh, but when you watch somebody die of disease, um, to me, uh, that's particularly uh, painful because it's slow, it's gradual. And again, I go back to, it doesn't seem as cool, as honorable mm. as going out in a blitz. And that's got to be a personal thing because you're not looking. I can't imagine. I know you. I know you're not looking at your buddy in his hospital bed thinking, boy, he's less than honorable because he's got this life crippling. I know you're not thinking it, but you feel it and you feel for him because he may be very well feeling. God, I wish I wish it wasn't this way. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's completely accurate. And and you know what? These men have served. So however they go. They're going on. Amen. But the, the, the manner, the disease process, especially a slow disease like cancer. Yeah. Again, I go back to, we all want to go out like Josie Wales. But, yeah. I, um, before, before we go to break, I want to ask you a question. Um, there's a particular sort of lilt or a wrinkle to your dying this way. You have shared with me, and I don't, I'm pretty sure not anyone else, that what makes it so hard for you, and you correct me if I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What makes yeah. it so hard for you is the thought of dying alone. The thought of dying without a woman. Yeah, without a woman, uh, without a woman and without my men. Mm. So since I retired, I lost my tribe. Um, so yeah, I'm absolutely going through this alone. And, uh, you know, I'm a big boy. I can take it. But, uh, I'd, I'd rather not do it this way. Well, and and no one, you don't, I mean, I can understand you want to say I'm a big boy, I can take it, but no one's disputing you're a big boy. No one's dis- disputing your toughness and that you absolutely can. But the mere fact, I think for a lot of people, this is the shit where I wanted you on the show. I've, I've counseled many military, many special forces from the highest ranks to the lowest ranks uh, over the decades. And what so many people don't realize is that the real badasses are just as soft and afraid as all of us inside. There are aspects. Everybody has their aspect. Doesn't mean they back down from a fight. I'm not calling anyone a pussy. That's not it. We are all nonetheless human. And you have revealed your humanity and the fear and the fear of dying. You you told me something that I'm like, no fucking way. You told me, and I believe you now because you've explained it, but, you know, when you're in battle, you would tell your men, you know, we're, I was never scared to die in battle. You would tell your men at every mission. What would you tell them at the beginning of every mission? This is your last mission. You are not, you're, you're, you're going to die. And if you don't have that mentality, then you might kill the guy next to you. Right. Wow. And so... Uh, that that's a powerful mentality, but now we're talking about not just the dying, but the wasting away. And for you, this ultimate badass to admit that there's fear and there's sadness inside is, is like a, you, whether you feel it or not, that is a breath of fresh air because you're not the only one. And I've counseled enough to know that that fear and similar fears exist in even the toughest of the tough, that in the end we're human, aren't we chief? When you're faced to look at your mortality, yes, you know, and there was a large, uh, you know, a large percentage of my life where I was, you know, 10 foot tall and bulletproof, right? Right. Or at least in my head I was. Yeah. And then when you're faced to deal with true mortality, it lets you know that, man, you're just as human as the next person. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the uncertainty I think is the worst that, that, that I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I've got a, a huge freaking noggin. I think I can beat anything, you know, but who knows? I, you know, I may not be here six months from now. And to, and this last episode with the plural fusion, where I truly believed I was dying at the moment, had a vision of the woman in my life pulling me back mm. uh, and saying, it's not your time yet. It changes what, how you look at the rest of, of, of rest of life in general. How above all else does it change it for you? How does it change it? Life is fragile. And the fragility of it, uh, we take, I think we take for granted. You took you it know, for I mean, You've taken it for granted. Yeah, and I think in general, as humans, we do. Right. You can die across from the no road, doubt. but we don't think. 
right? No doubt. No yeah. doubt. When you're, when you're faced with your own mortality, right? Uh, you are, first of all, I have, I have revisited every mistake I've made in my life mm. that I can remember. All right. Um, I've judged myself and, and I have, I, you know, I have a personal faith that I'm okay with the mistakes I've made, but still, you know, oh my gosh, that girl I cheated on 20 years ago. But like, why would I think about that right now? I wouldn't if I wasn't facing what I'm facing. But why are you thinking about it? No, nothing wrong with it. And I encourage that sort of thinking with my clients, as you know, and, and bringing up the feelings and flushing them out. But I'm curious, why were you thinking it? Why were you, why did it come up for you? According to my faith, I'm going to be held accountable at, at some point. And so it was largely about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to have to say to my higher power mm. when he asked about that girl I cheated on 20 years ago? Or, right. or, or whatever, you know, 10 feet and bullet, 10 foot tall and bulletproof. You don't think about this stuff. You're not worried about it. Right. Um, when you have to start facing your own mortality, you do have to face the mistakes you've made. You have to judge yourself before you are judged. Mm. All right. That's my point. That's fair. That's fair. We're actually going to be talking about faith in uh, one of the subsequent segments, because I know that's very important to you. Um, we're going to go to break now, but you, we've sort of opened up the door here on love, but also on, uh, your, your relationship to women and the yeah. origins. And let me tell you folks, the most interesting part in my opinion is yet to come. And it's not just the part you think, Jeremy, it's, it's, I, it's that first marriage as well. I think this is going to shock the living shit out of a lot of people, but what's really going to blow your mind. And he gave me permission. So, you know, and, and, uh, we're going to, you're going to hear, you guys always hear me talking about childhood. You're going to, you want to hear a fucking childhood. You want to hear a fucking childhood. Stay right. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. My wife pushed me to watch this guy's TikTok videos. So I finally caved in and holy crap, blew me away. I started watching more, and every damn time he opens his mouth, I get blown away in a whole new way. So I finally bought his book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup. To say I got an ass kicking is an understatement. Much needed. It was like having my own personal tough therapist who just gets it. So go do yourself a favor. Get There's a Hole in My Love Cup. It's powerful stuff. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. We are back with Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy. And uh, Chief, it's, it's so great to have you here. You've been uh, just sharing some really profound stuff. Uh, I was just talking with... Uh, KC and Rob during the break and KC, I said, how are you doing? You know, what do you think? And she said, I'm in shell shock. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think for a lot of our listeners, it's, uh, it's quite a story, but <laughs> we're just getting warmed up, sugar tits. Um, I didn't say <laughs> that to KC. She would hit true. me. I'm speaking to my listeners. <laughs> I would <laughs> never say that to KC unless I wanted to punch in the face. Um, not that we condone violence on this show. Um, <laughs> if I come with bruises, you know where it came from. Uh, no. Uh, so I, I, <laughs> so I brought up, uh, Folks, I, I just talk differently when I'm around guys and uh, and different people, and you sort of have to adjust for your audience. And uh, the nice thing about when I'm working with military and special forces guys is that it's a side of me that I don't get to be very often uh, from uh, just my past growing up with all brothers and a pretty strong dad and and so forth. And so it's I feel like I'm around a bit of a brother when uh, Jeremy and I get together. Uh, but I brought up women, I brought up love. And to sort of start that out, I, I want to weave uh, KC in here. She doesn't often come out of the booth, but she's out of the booth. And uh, she said she has a question or two. So Jeremy, I'm going to just bring her in here. Um, we're going low tech today. And uh, KC is with us here. KC, go ahead. I, I just said, when I was listening to you, I was thinking about, you know, the word courage. And what it takes to be able to to go into the type of situations that you've gone into. There's this saying, and I'm going to totally blow it. It's like something like the the courage is not the absence of fear. And and so I wonder what it's like to go into those situations. Like, are you thinking like what you said to your your 
your underlings or your troops, you know, this is your last mission. I would think that that was the absolute worst thing to say to somebody going into a situation like that. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you get the courage to do what you do, number one, but also, you know, how would saying something like that help the situation? Because you also said something about life is fragile and we walk around every day and we don't really realize how fragile it is. And I think, sure. I think that realizing how fragile life is creates a lot of anxiety in people. I almost think it's, it's better when you're stupid, you know, like you're just totally ignorant of the fact Being that beautiful. it really is. Blessed. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, and I would think that you have to be a little oblivious or I've always thought you have to be a little bit oblivious to put yourself in the types of situation that military and especially, you know, special ops has to put themselves in. And so can you help reconcile a little bit of that for us? Sure. So, so to the first part of the question, like how do we get there, right? Uh, it, I mean, it comes with uh, it comes with training and what I call pre-habilitation. I mean, jumping out of an airplane, jumping out of the, the back of an airplane at twenty one thousand feet at night with a hundred pounds of gear strapped on you is scary. If you're not afraid, then you shouldn't be doing the job. And and that that equates to combat. <laughs> if you're not afraid to go in then I don't, you're reckless and I don't want to work with you, you know, and, and we kind of weed people like that out. Uh, so fear is inherent uh, to, you know, to the maximum you're talking about, uh, you know, in the face of fear, continue, you know, doing it anyways, that's what I call courage. But fear is always, is ever present in, in this, in any of these, you know, military you know, occupations. And like I said, if you're not afraid, then you're reckless or you just haven't been there yet. As far as telling my men what I told them, uh, I've had commanders that told me that I was reckless, that I was irresponsible. Uh, but I stand by what I said, because the reality is if you're not willing in this job, if you're not willing to die doing the job, then you shouldn't be doing it. And so you need to be prepared for that. Uh, and you know, mm-hmm. that's living wills, that's, uh, what we call death letters, that's, you know, making sure all of your affairs are in order because I don't want you thinking that this is another walk in the park. That's, that's on one hand, easy for you, the soldier to do the airman to do what, what's the mentality of the people that love them, the, the woman in your life that you were married to when you were going through this, or, you know, the, what's it like for the one who loves you? Yeah. So this, oh, this job cost me two marriages. You know, when people are knocking on your door to go, Hey, we don't know where he is. We know a helicopter crashed. We're not sure if he's alive or whatever. I mean, as a mother and as a, you know, a mother of two children at that, um, that's got to be rough, man. and and it wrecks them. You know, the the and, and I have always said the true heroes are the ones who didn't come home, and the spouses who had to wait for us to come home. Mm-hmm. And so, on this notion, you brought up your your wives. You brought up uh, love and the ones who love your first marriage. You've described to me, and we won't get into all the gory details, but one of the most remarkable pieces about it. Uh, that you've described to me is that for as tough and badass as you were in your work life, in your life, and you had to be from childhood, which we'll get to, but in your first marriage, you talk about how you were literally a completely different person, Jeremy, that who you were on the battlefield, who you were around the men, who you were in your work and everything else. But when you walked in that door, who were you? Yeah, I I was, uh, and, and not just my first, it's actually both of my marriages. Um, you know, at work, I was the, the master sergeant, I was the team leader, I was the chief, I was whatever. Uh, but when I went home, you know, pardon my language, I was the bitch. Uh, I was physically and emotionally abused by both of my spouses. Uh, I used to go to work with black eyes and scratches and, and, and tell lies. Told them I got into a bar fight because I was embarrassed to tell them that 
I just got beat on my way. Right. Bar fight is cool. Yeah. Beating up your wife by your wife, not so cool. How does that happen, Jeremy? How does a guy who suffers, I mean, because I think a lot of people have the image, well, you're tough, then you must be a hard ass at home, and you're a hard ass to your wife, and you're a hard ass to your kids, and so on and so forth. And, and you're shaking your head, no? How the hell does that happen? I learned very early on that my work persona had to be different from my home persona, because at work, I was. I'm the alpha, you know, I'm a freaking gunslinger, I'm, you know, all, you can't bring that into the house. I mean, you can't. The way that I did it, uh, which in hindsight I would do differently, was I became diametrically opposed. I became the opposite of my work person. So I became passive. Uh, I was I was there to listen. I was there to provide. Uh, you know, and then you just you, I took it on the chin when I had to take it on the chin. But why? Why did you take on this opposite persona? Why did you take on this? Why? I mean, was it even was it even conscious? It definitely wasn't conscious. Uh, the only way I can accurately describe it is just the yin and yang. I was the black wolf when I was on the battlefield. When I was home, I was the white wolf, and the white wolf was passive. Um, it's also the whole concept of. Um, harnessing the masculinity and the feminine. Sure. And sure. But as you getting your doctorate in psychology, I know that a part of your work and working with people and you've worked with many victims, not, you know, victims of all sorts of things. It's just part of your work. And one of the things, what it, you know, and I've me too. And so what's one of the things that we do with victims, uh, you know, uh, purging the trauma and the emotion, all that goes with it. But then part of the teaching is teaching boundaries. And that you have every right to have boundaries and you need to have boundaries to protect yourself. What you're saying in is I went home and it's like I had no boundaries. She would beat me physically. She would emotionally abuse me and so on and so forth. Um, and and w let me ask you, what do you think was the fear driving the behavior? You know how I am about fear. I have to take this or I'm going to lose her. Mm. I, I have to endure this or she's going to go away. And what happens to and, you, what happens inside of you? So the fear of her leaving me, the fear of the rejection, the fear of the abandonment, or the fear of being alone, which, uh, what happens inside of you or what did you fear happening inside of you when that happened? Mm -hmm. If she left, what would be the experience going on inside of you? Because it's not just the person leaving. When you left for uh, every day for work, you weren't with her. So it's not the physically being together per se. Yeah, it's nice to have someone to come home to, but it's really about the fear of something happening if she were to reject you, if she were to walk away. What is it that would have happened inside of you back then? We're not talking about Jeremy today. We're talking about Jeremy back then. What would have happened inside of you if she had rejected you? I, I did not feel like a complete person. So it was very easy for me to feel like a complete person at work because I had all these technical skills and, you know, I had bona fides and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, in my personal life, um, I didn't feel like I was a complete person unless I had somebody else to validate. So they had to be there, tell me I'm a great guy, hey, good job love me, uh, there's, you know, intimate, physical intimacy, all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the thought of losing that huge validation invalidated who I was. So she existed at some deep level. She existed to validate your worth. And as long as, okay, so as long as she, this woman that you so loved, admired, etc. As long as she was with you, it was a validation. It was a confirmation of your worth. But that implies, sure. does it not, that inside of you, there was another voice invalidating you. Without a doubt. And in our time together, working together, uh, I've had to revisit that I wasn't good enough for myself. I needed somebody else. I mean, I think, uh, I think most of your listeners feel the same way. Like their husband or their wife is their validating. And... The, the losing them uh, and i'll tell you and Sven, like this is something that we should probably talk about in our next session but i'll just I'll, I'll i'll share it with your listeners i have a very uh close friend of mine 
She's my high school girlfriend. I've loved this woman for 35 years. High school girlfriend, okay. Yeah. We went 25 years without talking. But she is in a relationship. She's in a marriage, 24-year marriage. She's not. She's miserable. But she's going to stay there because he's her validation. He's her stability. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, we're not in the, the nuclear family age anymore. So it's not him bringing home the bread kind of thing. But he is the, the stability. And she will remain unhappy because of that stability, because of that validation, because of where I was. And you want her. I mean, let's just put it all on the table. You want her yeah. and you had uh, dreams of the two of you being together. And even if you were, even if God had it in his plan for you to pass away, she was going to be with you. Your hope was that she would be with you at the end. And so isn't it true that the grand loss isn't the loss of life per se, but the loss of life without her? Accurate? Without a doubt. 100%. And, and, you know, as, as I alluded to, or as I said earlier in your interview, uh, that vision of somebody who grabbed me by the hand and said, come back, you're not done, was this late. Mm. What I want to get at then is what you were talking about in terms of uh, going into this marriage sort of scared. Scared that I need yeah. that at some level I need some I need a this person particularly a woman to validate my worth someone to love me to validate my worth to be the counter message to the existing message inside of me the existing message inside of Jeremy Hardy was what yeah I I, I wasn't a person without that. and I, I think it goes beyond validation but I I'm not worthy like I'm good at like freaking killing bad guys and saving good guys. Got it, right? Every other aspect of my life, I felt inferior, and I needed somebody else to make me feel like a whole person. When you were 18, uh, the day you turned 18, you flew the coop, and you got got into the Air Force and had the dream, and, and so on and so forth right away. When you were 18, when you were 19, when you were you know 23, what was the message, what was the tape playing inside of you of who you were? In, in 20-year-old terms, what was the loop that if you weren't you know, drinking or, or on a mission or fucking a woman, what was the loop that would play? Yeah, well, you kind of said it all right there. Like that was, my, that was my role in life was to fuck, drink, and fight. <clears throat> and anything outside of that was irrelevant at that moment. But what was your what was the message that you believed about yourself? Those fighting, fucking, and, oh. and drinking and boozing were what made the message go away. What numbed the message? What quieted the message? What was the message? I was the I was still the ninety pound weakling from high school. I'm still this weak, puny guy, uh, and you know and we can get into all the gory details of, of my mother when you want to, but uh, all of those negative things that, that I was, you know, force fed growing up that became me. And so I was trying to compensate. First of all, becoming a PJ was a compensation. I was proving to myself that I wasn't weak, puny, small, worthless, lazy, et cetera. And did it prove it? Did it make that voice go away? It did not. Okay, just just to pause here, folks. This badass, absolute fucking monster, fucking killer, dragon slayer, all the shit, Game of Thrones shit, that's all make-believe. This guy's real. This is a real-life dragon slayer, all right? And this motherfucker had fear and self-loathing inside of him. And he, he's basically saying one set up the other. One needed the other, that, that, that you becoming a PJ almost needed a guy who was so fucking insecure and self-loathing. And we'll expand on that and how many times we see that in, you know, in military and special forces guys and, you know, extreme experienced guys, because, you know, you have to have a bit of psycho in you almost. I mean, this is crazy that you had these fears. You had this self-loathing in you and that even when you reach the pinnacle, the first pinnacle, and that was becoming a special forces operator, you got pinned on your special force operator. That didn't make the voice go away. For like 
all of our listeners that are hating themselves for one reason or another, you know, you have this total badass person that is brave beyond belief thinking that he's this weak, skinny little kid. And in the meantime, he's jumping into war torn situations, jumping out of helicopters, saving people. Um, Sven and I just listened to a commencement speech, um, which I'd like him to tell you a little bit about because it sort of weaves into the situation with you. And I guess I just want to, I want our listeners that are hating on themselves for one reason or another to just know that we all suffer from this or a lot of us do, you know, even when they, we reach the top of our, our game, you know, there are still those voices from childhood telling us we suck. And not only that, no, consider the achievements that he had already had in his early 20s. He became a special force operator. He was kicking ass and taking names around the motherfucking world. His men looked up to him. He was climbing up through the ranks. His buddies looked up to him. And no amount of achievement made that voice go away. The voice didn't, and, and, and Jeremy will attest, the voice didn't begin to go away until he finally, life sort of kicked his ass enough that he had to go into it and confront it. And he got into a particular aspect of it, entheogenic medicines, which we'll be getting into, and he's a specialist in that field. But uh, that nothing, no successes, no titles, no money, no booze, no achievements, no nothing, no matter how many generals he saved, that voice was still inside of him. I just want to say that for me, what makes you a badass is not just your ability to go into those type of situations and be a killer. But for me, what makes you a badass is your ability to be kind, to dial it down, Amen. to not be an asshole, you know, and, and to know, to, to have those, well, those two speeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all a little bit of an asshole at one time. Turning it on and turning it off as the situation yeah, requires. Turning it on and turning it off. So for for me, that's that's what makes you really special to me. Well, I, I appreciate that, but I tell you, you know, and I feel qualified to speak for my entire community. I think we're all that way, right? Um, yeah, there are some pretty sadistic people in the military, just like in law enforcement and you know first responders, et cetera. But I think the most of us uh, are like we are soft. Uh, when when we're not you know, on the job, uh, and I think that's what makes us who we are. I think that dichotomy uh, is what makes us good at what we do, because we can turn it on, turn it off. Um, but going back to what Ben and I were talking about, most of us, and I'm not saying everybody's like me going home getting beaten by, beaten up by a you know 100 pound woman and all that. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I think the greatest of us. John Chapman's prime example. Uh, John Chapman is a uh, Medal of Honor recipient. The only Medal of Honor ever captured on video, by the way. That man was one of the softest men, the just humble, kind, soft. I mean, he was, that's who he was. But he also died hand-to-hand fighting Taliban guys in the top of a mountain in Afghanistan. And I mean, he... And and he was on a a joint operation. You can see this video on YouTube. It was a joint operation with SEALs. He was defending SEALs. Correct. Wow. And he got a double double medal of honor. Is that right? So he was, uh, he he was awarded the Air Force Cross. That's it. Which is the second highest. Uh, And then President Trump and General Goldfein got it upgraded to a medal of honor. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. A new book out about it. There's a movie coming out. Uh, about uh, about this whole thing and, and like you mentioned you can go on YouTube the only Medal of Honor ever captured on video and you can watch this guy walking through you know waist high snow defending a, a SEAL team and uh, they left because they thought he was dead well he was still alive and he took on 40 Taliban fighters and there was at oh. least three that he hand-to-hand combat. Unbelievable. Yeah, you, you, like, you read books about that stuff. You know, you can watch it. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, John Chapman is, you know, Chappie is one of, he's one of my personal heroes. And I, I just want to say that I, I think for me, and to say to those people that rag on the military or, you know, say bad things about them, 
you know, it is that extreme love for people, mm. you know, and the passion for people that allows you to go into those kind of situations where you go from being a gentle and kind person to being able to be a killer, you know, with, with the idea that you are defending those that you love. Mm. And, and so mm. for me, that's just incredible. And thank you. Mm. Well, and I, and I, and I appreciate that. And I know it sounds cliche, but, um, men that do this kind of work, um, they're not doing it for God and country. Okay. I mean, that sounds great, but they're doing it for that guy next. Mm. And that, that, like you're talking about that love for my, my teammate, has, it does, it transcends into our personal lives as well. Mm. And so I want to go there. Um, in our next episode, I have a few areas I want to go. I want to go to a few things we've touched on specifically the mother we're going there. The second piece is you had said just a minute ago to KC, you had said, well, we're all that way referring to, you know, the fears inside and the feelings inside. And you said, we're all that way. And I want to explore that because your work is with veterans and there it, part of the healing, in order for the healing to happen, as you and I know from our work, but you've worked with plenty of people, I've worked with plenty of people, and until they drop their resistance, I can't help them. I, they have to trust you, and they do trust you, and it's when we reveal our humanity, and that I have, I've had those feelings you're feeling, or that fear of your wife, or that when you walk home, you're a different person. I've had plenty of military that I have uh, counseled, and when they get home, they're different because they're so ingrained in the service-oriented mindset. They're so ingrained in doing everything for everyone at the utter expense of themselves. So I want to get into all of that with you, and uh, as well, so I want to get into, uh, we're all that way. I want to get into mom, and I also want to get into uh, shame, shame death of a friend, that sort of thing. I want to get into shame in the next episode. So that will be episode two with Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy. Uh, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on and uh, sticking around as well for episode two. You're, you're fucking amazing. I'm just so honored to be here. You know I love you, man. I love and, you too. Uh, I'm just... I'm honored to be here. The honor is 2,000% ours, motherfucker. All right. Uh, on behalf of Rob and KC, um, we are in the middle of this fantastic stuff with uh, Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy, where you're tuning in from, wherever it may be. Have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day. Hey.